So we have 50 minutes and we have three papers. And you'll see in the program that the first one up is Warwick again, but to give him a breather, we're going to reverse him and Winston. So Winston is gonna be our first speaker uh, on this perspectives from information systems panel, speaking about mapping the automated data assemblages of China's social credit system, 15 minutes. Thank you everyone. Uh, that was very interesting and a lot of information to process, I think in the last panel. So I'll try to keep it um, brief and Luckily we are, so Guana and I are presenting on an empirical paper that we're writing up. So just to introduce ourselves, I'm a PhD candidate at RMIT. My supervisors are Hai Ching and Julian over there. Um, uh, Guangnan, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so Guangnan has a computer science background. I have a economics and political economy background and we're working to sort of map very broadly, the data assemblages of the social credit system. Uh, so here are the research questions and I just added a little meme that's become popular um, that sort of um, reflects like what we're working on here in terms of the failure of the system as well. So mapping the whole social credit system, you can see that it's very fragmented like Xiang Gao said, I talked about um, previously. Um, so, these are the research questions. I'll just skip through it. So, oh, oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, they'll just bring it up. So I'll just keep talking while they bring up the slides, I think. Um, what should I talk about? <laughs> Uh, yeah, broadly, my research, my research questions were, uh, what are the major socio-technical components, networks, and relationships that map out the social credit systems data assemblages? Uh, the socio-economic question of how is it being implemented differently across geographic, demographic, um, and economic regions? And then what are the, how the fail, how the, how's the implementation of the social credit system mediated uh, and problem, problematized through different actors and networks. Um, luckily, the my first part of this presentation is just on the sort of uh, contextual stuff. So a big part of the so, uh, social credit system is the unified social credit code. Um, that's an identifier that is building on from previous business registration numbers, uh, government, uh, identification numbers, social security numbers. Thanks. So I'm up to here. Um, so I'm just listing out the sort of components that I'm describing of this data assemblages. Um, and that's what we're using to sort of do our empirical analysis and that will come later. The social credit code is being implemented actually beyond the formal social credit system of the judicial administrative and even financial uh, PBOC systems uh, into local governmental, provincial uh, administrative systems as well. So that's a big part. And of course the data, there's the public credit information, which is the 99% of what constitutes the social credit system today. Uh, market credit information coming from private entities uh, is another aspect and that's, that's supposedly growing. And then all the different uh, platforms as well, starting with the back end, uh, the PBOC's credit reference center, which was established before the official uh, launch of the social credit system and the national credit information sharing platform. They have long acronyms. These are being fed through, if we're looking at a, uh, a user perspective to the front end, Credit China, that's the most popular one for citizens. And then the National Enterprise Credit Information Publicity System for enterprises. And then there are the financial credit systems and the local credit systems. Oops. Beyond the technical stuff, there's also the institutions and I've just uh, put up the, a map from Fan Liang. He's presenting tomorrow, I think from China. He's not with us, but 
he wrote a really great paper that I'm drawing a lot on, on data infrastructure of the social credit system. And the NDRC is now uh, by far the most important um, in this joint interministerial council that has been established since I think 2002 or seven. There's been few meetings, PBOC as well. And then all these other ones, software, networking as well. I won't go into that. Uh, I put automation here because it is, of course, the theme of the conference. Um, but the social credit system, I think it is important to uh, make a mark in the sand, mark, make a mark that, it, as Schaefer notes, there is currently no known instance in which automated operational data collection leads to automated penalty issuance and corporate social credit system record generation without human intervention. Uh, and that has been reiterated in policy statements by officials as well. Uh, I, but I am in the, we are we are in this paper uh, mapping broader data assemblages using this USCC. And there are instances of um, automated data collection at least uh, in adjacent systems. So environmental systems in several provincial governments use. Uh, sensor technologies to determine pollution levels, water, uh, water, air pollution levels. Uh, but this then triggers inspection notice, and then the inspection is then done by a human. Smart cities as well. I won't go into that. That's been talked about a lot in this conference already. And then the Internet Plus initiatives, which Xiang, uh, Gao Xiang talked about earlier, is being rolled out, but I think it is in still in a fairly fragmented pace. So, oops, onto the empirical work that we've done. Um, we found a corporate information daily of China data set on GitHub, open source uh, sharing, and we've analyzed it. The description is up there. It was released on in 2019. 364,000 businesses, and the descriptive features here straight away point to lacking or failure in the system. 0% are completely, 0% of entries. So these are, we believe, we're not sure, are um, given, uh, inputted by uh, businesses themselves. 0% cases are complete. All of them are incomplete. The observed values, about 75% of all data is um, observed, 25% missing. Uh, getting into more detail onto specifically what type of data, um, these are variables, 30 variables in the data set, number of observations, percentage of observations as opposed to missing values, number of uh, missing values, and then percentage of missing values. Purple ones I've highlighted um, indicate the more useful variables. So number there refers to the business registration numbers, only about uh, less than 50% are there. And that's been already, as we can see in 2019, uh, overtaken by the credit code, almost 100%. Registered capital is another very interesting um, variable. It's the only, uh, so we analyze that further. And interestingly, yeah, a, yeah, address, so, and then city and province, of course, they're all 100% um, observed. What is interesting and is, again, a lacking of the uh, a drawback of the system as it's been implemented so far, according to the data set, is people are reluctant to give more information that they have to. Clearly addresses, contact numbers, emails, they were likely not um, uh, forced to. It wasn't a mandatory to put in that information. And then you can see almost 100% of those fields are missing. Uh, analyzing this data set further, and as I said, registered capital was the only a numerical variable. Uh, this is all the enterprises, and you can see this this graph really doesn't mean anything. You can see here this uh, these huge numbers, right, that are way beyond uh, everything else. So I move on. I've had to filter below 20 million RMB for registered capital for businesses. And you can see a pretty standard distribution here. This kind of makes sense. I'm just skipping further. 
And then this is the, um, the graph for excess of 100 RMB just for one business. Apparently these businesses here have uh, registered capital in excess of China's GDP per month. So these are clearly fake data. I've um, looked into this further, found the top five enterprises by registered capital and with giving more detail into this data set, you can see um, these are on the outskirts of the economy. So the first one, 183 trillion. So um, they, they wrote just random numbers, I guess. Um, they were it was canceled almost less than six months after it was recorded. This information, the business went under. So clearly that's been faked. And these you can see from the descriptions as well. These are just uh, maybe family businesses, you know, street businesses that did not feel obliged to um, give accurate information. And then only one business fun at the end that I found according to a different data source, the probable actual RMB amount. And I'll pass on to Wagner. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, yeah, apart from oops, this one, apart from the uh, uh, the failures in in the core data set, for example, the um, SCS, also CS, CS one, and also the social credit system, we want to expand the data set, um, to enrich, uh, expand the data set to put more information into the data set, enrich our um our uh, data set. So. The, one of the uses of why we wanted to expand our data set because, for example, here's this, um, so here's the data set that we found uh, in from other uh, data source. Um, it's a uh, municipal housing construction data set, and here's the data description. The reason why we something some failures or some errors that we couldn't find from the core data set um, is, for example, like this one. So. The last one, the uh, the eleven one, um, they change. These companies they change their name of the companies, but we still can identify it from the data set using the uh unique unique social credit code, and we can see right here. So this data set is collected from um in this year, and the the records for their previous name is in twenty nineteen. So this is one of the reason why we use, uh, we want to expand our data set to find, to extend it to a data linkage problem and to find the data relationship between um, different uh, systems. We want to know um, not just the failures will happen in the core data set, in the social credit system, but also it will affect the other systems. And also the other system will do it in reverse to affect the social credit system as well. So, yeah. Uh, and it's also very important to note, I think clearly the score is way below everyone else. And that's likely the reason for this uh, business deciding to try to change their name, to try to evade um, detection in this data set as opposed to uh, this data set. So as a summary, um, yeah, I found, we find that the data assemblages are still underdeveloped and contain failures relating to incompleteness there have been clear attempts to game and circumvent the system, as we've shown uh, with fake values. And uh, building on from yesterday's uh, keynote, what are the officials' actual aims to uh, imp uh, successfully implement this broad data assemblage given what we've seen in terms of failures? Thank you. I'm going to collect such questions and take them at the end of the panel and in lunch. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, the middle pan middle paper of this panel, um, Contrastive Analysis of COVID-19 Health in Misinformation Within the Online Chinese Language Community. Hi. Um, and I'll ask you to introduce yourself and also keep to time. Yeah. Fantastic. Sure. Thank you. Um, so hello everyone. Um, thanks, Pai Ching, for inviting me to speak to give the opportunity to speak to this community. Um, I'm I'm Jenny Zhang, and um, I'm the second author there. And Lin, uh, Lin is my PhD student, uh, actually from 
um, the School of Computing Technologies here within RMIT. So my expertise is actually in data science and um, AI and machine learning. But I think um, it would be interesting to share uh, what we have done um, in analyzing the um, social media, two different social medias on Twitter, um, English Twitter and Chinese Weibo, by analyzing the the online conversations, what we have people, what we have found about the um, COVID nineteen misinformation. Okay, so um, and we all know COVID nineteen is a disease pandemic, but um, in addition to being a pandemic for people, uh, you know, endangering people's health, it is actually a misinformation pandemic. And to the extent um, the um, World Health Organization uh, actually give a name for it, an infodemic. It is the pandemic of information that is spread during the COVID-19 since the December 2019 and throughout the process, different stages. So um, there is an official definition actually posted on the WHO website. It says an infodemic is too much information that may be false, may be misleading, but in digital or in the physical environments that, you know, during a disease outbreak. So it is the two things, the, um, the disease pandemic together with the misinformation pandemic that is endangering not people, not only public health, but also threatens our society. So um, give you a few examples there and let you see, you know, the first picture on the very left, um, top left corner is a, a sign from a, a supermarket in Melbourne saying, you know, every customer is limited to four rolls of toilet papers. So panic buying. And then on the right, you know, like the uh, Victorian government is supporting research that was in March 2021 on um, the increasing gambling activities during the pandemic because of information and that is circulating uh, that, you know, like we, we are, people are in such a panic mode and the mental health deteriorate and then the gambling ac um, activities increase. And the, down the bottom two are two photos about two demonstrations. And the, the, the demonstration on the left is people who um, go on the street in Melbourne against the policy of lockdown. And that was in um, 2021. And the picture on the right is actually another group that is gathering in Melbourne. They are um, supporting um, injection of um, vaccine and supporting lockdown, you know, like, so like, you know, you can see that the, the misinformation, uh, you know, like there are various sources of information about the origin of the, um, the, the virus. It was invented by Bill Gates supported the lab in Wuhan and two, you know, whether masks would help or not. And because of the, the different source of information and different uh, people's um, cognition, uh, cognitive bias, and at the, the, the different information divides our society and people have different beliefs and there are conflicts. So, um, so what we want to do, what we have done is, we want to study how does the misinformation um, impact the Chinese um, spoken community or uh, the Chinese language online community. So towards that, we actually collected um, data um, from the Chinese social media platform Weibo and we look at the analyzed online discourse and online conversations to find out people's attitude towards different um, claims and statements about the COVID-19 um, virus. And, um, and in contrast, we also analyze the English language community um, from the um, Twitter social media platform. So we contrast those two and see if there are differences, are the same values being um, discussed online um, on these two different um, online um, social media platforms. And so, um, so because we are um, data scientists, so we go to data, we collect data. So this is a data set that we use uh, with over um, 2000 um, Weibo micro blog posts. These are the source posts. And uh, remember that, you know, like those stats there shows 
um, the different um, types of posts. These are the source, source posts and they attract conversations, people's responses and comments on these posts as we want to analyze people's responses. Okay, and um, so um, to crawl data, we have to rely on some keywords. So we listed the keywords. These are the topics that um, people are interested in. And uh, um, based on that um, paper in 2021, actually we collected the, the different categories and you can see that some are about the virus and COVID, uh, coronavirus and COVID-19. And some is talking about the pandemic itself. That's the second um, category. And the third category is about um, figures um, public figures and organizations in there, you know, because the, in the Chinese data set actually discussed, you know, like again, here, there are some examples that uh, we see there. It talks about the, the in, um, for figures and organization, there is in, um, World Health Organization, and there are also, you know, international figures, uh, say like Fauci, who is the the uh, the head in um, U.S., who is responsible for the, um, the operation of the Chinese uh, of the U.S. government, you know, like um, organizing the um, the uh, COVID nineteen uh, activities in U.S. And there are also Chinese characters there, say Zhong Nanshan, someone very well known in the Chinese community, and Li Wenliang, Zhang Wenhong. These are all people, uh, public figures, talking about and uh, the, the pandemic okay and there are medical supplies and also policies of the chinese government and different local governments so these are the different um, types of um, um social media conversations we have collected for chinese um uh, from the chinese weibo and for english um language um uh, platform so uh, we similarly um use this um based on this data uh, this paper we collected um um um, Twitter social media posts uh, it, during the same period from December 2019 to, um, you know, 1st of September 2020, the same period. And then um, we look at these topics, um, COVID-19, coronavirus, and those are the keywords that are used to collect the data. And uh, this table shows uh, the statistics about the data that we have collected. So, um, from these two data sets, we actually analyzed um, some topics that are shared are common across these two uh, different platforms. You can see that, uh, you know, like um, we choose three topics. Okay, so the first one is um, WHO, World Health Organization, which is commonly discussed um, across the two different platforms. Okay, and the number of total posts uh, are across the different platforms and the keywords that we have used to collect the, um, the, the data. And the second topic is about mask. And the third topic is about vaccine and vaccination. Okay, so this is the data for our analysis. And um, what we want to analyze, um, we want to um, find out, uh, focus on the three research questions. The first is, what's, what are the values? that are being communicated online within these um, online communities. And secondly, um, people's responses, uh, you know, the, the, the public responses um, and their emotions from the different communities to the values that are, and associated with these values are discussed in these online communities. And um, we also want to, uh, this is um, ongoing work and um, further analyze the association of uh, the different values that are discussed online and the people's responses uh, and the, the role that it, the veracity of information plays uh, in, this, um, uh, uh, in this process. So the methodology we have used actually, um, the, we, we are, uh, to analyze online discourses, we actually use the linguistics. Um, there is a appraisal framework, which Actually, um, it is um, analyzing the uh, the linguistic features that uh, by analyzing the linguistic features, and then we can um, um, figure out the uh, the appraisals or the evaluation people express to for specific ideation, so that we can. Uh, it's actually a social um, semiotic approach uh, analysis to uh, understand the value that is being uh, discussed in the um, in the discuss. Uh, in the disc in online discussions, and um, to 
analyze um, the emotions and people's responses, we actually use an AI tool, which is a machine learning tool. Uh, it is actually a deep learning. Uh, you just can understand it as a machine learning tool that we can use that can um, analyze people's emotions using uh, represented as emoticons. You will see some examples. Okay, so just show you what we have done. So this is an online conversation. And the first on the top is some statements from someone, so, uh, you know, quoting some, some line from Trump. Trump says, you know, um, the Democrat, uh, Biden and the Democrats wants to prosecute um, Americans by entering, uh, by um, going to a church, but not for destroying a church. Okay, I'm going uh, quickly. And these are the people's responses. And what is highlighted are actually the, uh, the appraisal uh, phrases that people express opinions and evaluations. And you can see here what I highlight in the first line, the crazy left that shows the value. People think that's the crazy West. That that's that's people's uh, judgment and evaluation. And what we have done is we extract all these appraisal phrases using the linguistic um, appraisal framework, so that we can summarize and see uh, what are the mostly um, uh, communicated um, in the online network uh, in the online platform. And you can see here. Here is the result of the sum uh, visualization of the summarization. Uh, you can see it's not one hundred percent correct. There are some that are not quite humanly um, understandable, but you can see that all um, the appraisal phrases about um, WHO, you know, there are phrases like, uh, this is the, the, on the top is the English platform is from Twitter. It says, brings back health alert, alert brings, which talks about the functions of WHO. But on the, um, you know, the bottom is the Chinese community. They're talking about getting worse. Okay, and um, you know, um, 10, 000, more than 10,000 cases are, that have been uh, um, diagnosed. And um, you know, it's like, what's the phases of the, of the pandemic? You can see that the ideation, the values that are communicated online it, on this topic about WHO is different. And similar, this is similarly about um, on the topic of mask. Uh, the English uh, the language community is talking about, you know, mask critical, critical prevent, wear mask, and um, the, Chi uh, the Chinese community, in addition to talk about mask, uh, you know, is talking about uh, can't buy mask, my my budao kou zhao, I can't buy mask. So it's like uh, such a differences, and so, you know, like this is on the topic of vaccine, and here I think we can see the shared value uh, across the two communities. You know, the first one is talking about clinical trial of vaccines and vaccine candidates, you know, and um, trial um, uh, uh, vaccination. And on the bottom in the Chinese community, you can see that Kai Shi Yanfa starting to clinical trial and Zhuo Shou Yanfa is talking about the same thing. So these are the values that are being communicated. And on some topics are the same, some topics are different. And these are the responses from the uh, from the community. Just, uh, I only have time to explain a little bit about this um, pie chart. And you can see that uh, um, uh, from the top to the bottom, you will uh, compare the Chinese, uh, Ch English against the Chinese. And the most prominent on this topic of WHO, the most prominent um, uh, um, emotion is summed up in the, uh, uh, in the Chinese, uh, in the English community. But in the Chinese community, the source post actually is folded hands, but on the right, which is in the responses, I think we should focus on the responses, which is tears of joy. This is the, uh, the most prominent emotion. And uh, you can see similarly the distribution of other, on masks, they're very similar. You can see the blue across everywhere. So that's very consistent on masks. But on, again, on vaccine, it's very different. You know, like for the English community, thumbs up is very, very common both in the source post and the, the response posts. But uh, in the Chinese community, it is very different. You can see that the prominent for the Chinese community in the source post is um, tears of joy. But in the responses, is um, uh, the most prominent is this um, yellow kind of um, block face with rolling eyes. So what we <laughs> so the, the responses are on the same you know on the same topic are very different. So what we have found. And you can see the here's the summarization on some uh, on WHO and on Musk, um, they have uh, 
different, sorry, on a, about a different values about at WHO and a mask, but similar things uh, they talk about vaccine. But in terms of uh, the responses of the crowd, of the, uh, of the public, we have uh, different, um, different emotions across the English and the Chinese community. But one um, important observation is, um, if you go back to the slides online, you can have a look, but this, what we, one additional thing that we have noticed is um, in the source post, and the response from the uh, from the public for the English community, the 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 emotions are very much consistent. But in the Chinese community, our analysis shows the source post emotions, people who first post and people's reactions are very different. So that's a, another interesting observation I would like to highlight. So um, and some collaborators I want to acknowledge. Thank you. Right. This, this panel on perspectives from information systems really is showing us what can be done with data, not just uh, by us, not just by governments. Uh, we return now to Warwick, who is going to speak about automated decision making in cross-border trade. And whether you've got data in your presentation, I don't know, but please keep it to 15 minutes. Yeah. All right. Um, the fact that I'm here again um, is really an, an, an accident. Um, partly because uh, the original response to the call for papers saw myself and my team just lob a few things in. Um, and then ultimately the response came that said, yep, no, that's, that's great. And I said, um, which one? Both. Right, okay. Well, there went January. So, so that was the end of um, uh, the holidays. What I was going to walk through with you today um, is actually at a very different register from the other paper. This is driven initially by some very practical work that, um, that my team and I engaged in both at a research and design level, but also at a, at a practical implementation level. Um, I will go through probably the first uh, two thirds of the slides incredibly quickly, because I'm also under instructions from Hai Ching to focus a little bit more on the um, the critical challenges emerging rather than necessarily go through with you the technical um, design um, approaches that we adopted. The first thing was, of course, was to understand the nature and extent of the problems. And um, as we know, global trade is big business and it is also incredibly documentary intensive. It involves a lot of paper um, and it still does. And one of the transaction costs in global trade is the fact that the movement of money is conditional upon the paperwork being satisfactory. And this is what I mean when I earlier described abstractly that idea of data moving in one direction and money flowing in the other. So in practical terms, in terms of international trade, particularly trade that's financed through letters of credit, those letters of credit have to be presented and they're typically presented still in documentary form, in, photograph, in photocopies, in envelopes taken to banks, literally to present them as if you were presenting a check for settlement. And inside a bank, there are people deep in the basements who essentially sit in their credit worthiness and risk teams who go through these piles of paper and check whether they believe that those bits of paper are authentic or not. In fact, in Collins Street, somewhere not too far from here, there's a group of people who implement the two eyes, four eyes and six eyes policies, which is, look, I'm not sure if this document's authentic. I need to show it to a colleague to check. That's four eyes. So this is how trade and trade finance tends to work. And it is incredibly expensive. It's time consuming. And from a system point of view, it actually causes a clogging not only of the physical goods themselves, but it also causes a clogging of the flow of finance. And when finance gets clogged, it means that you need more in the system to keep the rest of the system going. So your finance is being stuck as capital awaiting release. As a producer and an exporter, I need to pull on more trade credit to keep the system going. And that's a cost to myself, 
and it's a, also a cost to the system and it gets passed on through to consumers. And there's a number of problems or risks. Information asymmetry is actually at the heart of this. And so this is why distributed ledgers is foundational to tackling the problems inherent in uh, economic flows that are dependent upon information. We also have problems in payments, obviously, as I described, and the documents themselves are significant risk vectors, authenticity, veracity of data, whether they satisfy the relevant um, uh, protocols to be treated as acceptable and appropriate. And this is actually a flow diagram from Bank of China in terms of how a letter of credit is issued and settled. And I've highlighted in here with just some red bits, um, the elements where, where documents matter. Right? So, so this is just to give you a sense that these are complex flows where information actually matters to keep the system flowing. In a typical transaction, and the ones that we were engaged in, the export of beef to China, it involved um, something like nine different documents as foundational documents involving seven or eight different um, uh, principal signatories to actually make this system valid, right? So these are every one of these is a, is a risk point. Something can be wrong um, or erroneous. This really just summarizes the documents and the actors involved. In abstract terms, the challenges we tackle is, is validating the signers themselves. Um, are they signers with authority to sign, number one? Um, and are the signatories themselves authenticated? So these are important questions around how digital systems need to support um, authenticated KYC, know your client and identity verifications, and ultimately deliver confidence to the actors that the, that the signatories are both um, appropriately authorized and also the ones signing themselves. The second one, of course, relates to the message itself. So again, at an abstract level, somebody signs something, there's a sender, what we send is a message, then there's a receiver. And the message really is about whether or not the, the content of the message is accurate or not, um, whether it's been altered or not, or whether in fact, it's a message that was meant for something else that's being reused. Right? And we see that um, happen in terms of um, reusing insurance documents. Um, so the insurance document itself is, is authentic, signed authentically and all of that. It just so happened that it was for a consignment six months ago that wasn't from Australia. Right? And it's being used to pass off as something that's authentic today. Another area of risk is invoicing, where invoicing is used as security for finance. So um, we raise a lot of operational finance on the back of invoices as securities. The risk from a lender's point of view is that somebody with an invoice could take the same invoice to five or six different lenders um, and raise debt against that invoice. And that happens. You'll remember um, early last year, a very large global um, supply chain finance company went broke. Um, it's headed by an Australian and it had grown incredibly monstrously, essentially delivering factor finance. And it went broke because of actually this reason. Most of its invoices were fake. So it was raising capital from investors into funds against the security of either fake invoices, multiple used invoices or invoices for potential future trade that I'm invoicing for today, but the actual business won't happen for a year. What are the solutions? That's a bit abstract. We, we actually designed and implemented a, um, a, a multi-sig deal room on a public ledger um, or on a distributed ledger. Um, and we did that on our own blockchain, which is a, an Ethereum virtual machine compatible network. And it enables us to very, very quickly um, deliver really uh, an, an environment where there are multiple signatories, number one. We KYC those signatories so that we can confirm the identities of those signatures. Uh, the signatures are signed as public private keys. So it's a public key that we that everyone can obviously see. And unless you give your private key away to somebody else, then we know that it had to be you who signed. Um, and we deliver that at three layers. So it's actually a, a, a federated multiple signatory contract where the documents that are needed to satisfy the deal are actually signed by multiple signatories. The sensor data that has to uh, satisfy the conditions of finance has to be signed by 
um, the multiple sensors. So in our case, it was sensors to do with weight, location and temperature. And also the buyer and the seller themselves have to be satisfied that the deal conditions have been set. And should all those signatories sign this contract, then the transaction happens. In diagrammatic form, this is essentially the structure. So we can build out complex federated multi-sig arrangements where there are multi-sigs inside multi-sigs to deliver um, credible solutions around validations of signatories as well as messages themselves to drive the functional instructions that we embed in smart contracts. So a smart contract for us is literally an input output machine. If a certain range of conditions are satisfied within a particular set of parameters, then something as instructed should happen. And in this case, what should happen is an exchange of ownership certificates on the one hand and a redeemable token to then be able to collect money on the other. And we delivered that to enable timely data-driven, in effect, quasi-automated settlement of a transaction deal. And I say quasi-automated because we didn't totally remove the human. The buyer and the seller still had to sign. Um, but theoretically, of course, you could remove the human. Um, so long as the, uh, the geolocator tracker tr signs when the conditions are met and that the temperature sensors deliver sensor data that says that the meat was never above two degrees for more than you know, so much of the time in transit, then away it goes. But the things that I've been asked to sort of end on, I guess, is one of the, some of the challenges. So that's theoretically a fantastic solution, right? It's got a, a many layers of data security built in. Um, it has a, a lot of the, the security and integrity properties of distributed systems and all of that. That's great. But the real world is changing around us. And in the sense that um, initially, um, those technical solutions were designed when information flowed basically freely and there were a lot fewer concerns around data security, geopolitics and those sorts of things. So I'm going to wrap up by quickly touching on some of the context. We've obviously got a whole range of um, institutional architecture that impacts upon how um, trade happens. And in the case of Australia and China, um, RCEP is one. Uh, China and ASEAN is driving a lot of the regional trade. Um, China and BRI countries, of which much of ASEAN are members, is actually the biggest driver of China's growing trade. So what China does in this sense is going to be very, very impactful. China is the signatory to the Framework Agreement on Facilitation of Cross-Border Paperless Trade in Asia and the Pacific, um, and that will establish standards around how these messages are to be constructed, the content, the signatories, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of transnational institutional frameworks, non-technical, that are going to drive the way that technical solutions roll out. We're also seeing, of course, uh, the digitalization of currencies, um, and that's going to impact upon the technical architecture that um, will, will enable trade flows to take place. Currency multipolarity is here to stay. And trade will become less dependent upon the USD and less dependent upon SWIFT as an information transmission architecture. We are already seeing a whole bunch of alternatives to SWIFT as information architectures, including SIPs from China, the SPFS um, out of Russia, which has actually just been in the last 48 hours deployed to connect all Russian banks with all Iranian banks. There will no longer be sanctionable transactions between Russia and Iran now, because the messaging will take place upon a network that is no longer exposed to um, intervention by others. We, of course, have BRICS, which is, again, a geopolitical um, institutional architecture and the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, all of which are now talking about common information architectures and common currencies. So there are some friction points going forward. Digital currencies have friction points in terms of core design issues. Some of them are quasi values based philosophical, if you will. And there's a lot of debates about privacy and whether or not digital currencies um, issued by different central banks and 
uh, backed by different governments, satisfy particular privacy concerns of different jurisdictions. Um, we can talk a little bit about that at lunchtime, if you like. Programmability. Some digital uh, currencies will be more programmable than others. The EU or the central bank, our European Central Bank, is taking a view at the moment that it won't, that the European digital currency will not be programmable. Time will tell. My gut feeling is give it five years, it'll be programmable. Cross-border interoperability, big issue. Without it, right, we're not going to be able to move things backwards and forwards. Embridge is a driving piece of technical infrastructure that has actually come out of the Bank of International Settlements, working with PBOC, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, um, the Thai Central Bank of the UAE, to deliver digital currency-enabled cross-border transactions. And BHP, from Australia's point of view, by the way, has done two significant transactions in the last four years for iron ore with uh, denominated in RMB. So it's happening. Data friction points. Privacy and data sovereignty. Big topics, which, again, we can discuss later. Questions about what constitutes security concerns. Standards, right? It's like grammar, language. Data standards are pivotal to how we can move information in a way that makes sense to different actors. It's like having a common lingua. It's a lingua franca. At the moment, standards um, are only emerging, and they will be points of significant contestation and paper-based systems will disappear. So as that transitions and we move into a digital world, we will start to see emergent friction points. So there's a lot of barriers in a sense to tackling digitalized automated cross-border trade, um, most of which emerges not from the technology itself, but from the world in which technology is nestled. All of that is driven by research that includes not just me, but a whole bunch of my team at QUT and elsewhere. So just acknowledge them here as well. I'm going to get out of the way between everybody and lunch. Thank you very much. All right. I'm sure everyone in the room can smell lunch. If you're online, it smells really good. Um, thank you very much to all of our presenters. Um, I think for me, there is a huge methodological lesson in this panel. Um, it shows us why we need people with different skills, backgrounds, trainings to interrogate what data is available, whether it's on GitHub or whether we scraped it from Twitter or whether we're putting it into work to make signatories across borders possible. So please join me in thanking all of our presenters. Please ask them questions at lunch since they didn't have the opportunity to take questions from you during the panel. All right, we're back at one, uh, two o'clock. Um, for a very exciting panel on imaginary versus reality that Hai Ching is chairing herself. So I imagine it's going to be a good one. You want to take questions? You want to be, you want to be late for lunch? Ooh, this is not my decision, people. <laughs> I'm blaming Hai Ching. Are there questions in the room? There is one. Two. Two. Oh man. Um, thank you so much to the panelists for, um, like, um, like you said, a very interesting uh, discussion on data, which is um, the topic of our conference as well. Um, but I had a question with for the paper that had the data downloaded through GitHub, <laughs> which is very Winston. um Winston's paper. Yes. Right? Um, you come up here. Yeah, I, w I was just curious about the data set itself and sort of who, if you have additional information on who collected this data, how it was collected, you know, where they're scraping from, um, just to give us a more contextualization of the data um, and sort of the limits of using, if you don't know the answer to those questions, sort of what can we learn um, from those limitations? Um, I've contacted, um, I presume he's Chinese, he or she is Chinese, but um, no updates since 2019, since um, uploading the data set. They did it when, like in the description, it said recently um, officials have uploaded this data. So I presume it was quite timely and interesting then maybe to them. Um, 
yeah, I'm I'm a second year PhD candidate. I don't know how well I can use this data for my thesis even, but um, I just think it's interesting. We're trying to scrape more data. There's open government data sets available. Um, China's trying to do that. Um, and pred predominantly in uh, the more economically developed cities, major cities, of course. Um, more features, I can, yeah, I can talk to you more about it, uh, share it with you, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, sorry, I'm, this is a bit unclear when I explain it. Um, actually, we are facing, actually, we are facing some problems of the um, the fireworks in, in Vinod, and actually, I'm asking a colleagues uh, also from QUT to help us to collect the data. So actually, I mean, so for, for the um, GitHub data and also some data set from the social credit system, we do the web crap, uh, web scrape actually. And, but we also have some data set that we collected from uh, some uh, local governments and also some um, from different platforms. There's a reason why we wanted to uh, do the data linkage pro program. We wanted to enrich our data set, not just the, um, the social credit system because everyone studied it and we know it, we have a red list, a bread list, but we wanted to know how social credit system affects other systems. We want to know the relationship between systems and systems and how to know, uh, I want to know the difference uh, and imbalance um, geometric, uh, geographically or, um, or from different type of people from different uh, regions in China and different fields. A quick question for uh, Warwick. Uh, first, I really enjoyed both of your presentations. And uh, I just want to ask uh, one part because you explained it very quickly when you, you said you, you're going, you're, the, the system design, the blockchain system actually has uh, will trace sensor, right? So this is like international trade. Uh, so my question is actually about in November, 2021, China had a new like a personal information protection legislation and then I heard some of my friends. I don't. I know very little about international trade. Okay, in Singapore, there there, there are friends telling me that the this new uh, information, uh, you know, because they define private information in a very broad way. So it used to be the international the cargo ships before they get to China when they get close to the coastline, the, the their position, you know, would be picked up by the base stations along China's coastline. But now suddenly all these this uh, 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 GIS information become uh, probably personal information. So that it, that it creates a, a black hole, okay, for people to create, to, to trace, to track their uh, cargo uh, shipping once they get close to the Chinese coastline or once they land. Does that uh, affect your operation or is that problem already solved? There's a few issues to unpack there. Yeah, and they partly relate to this issue of what counts as personal information, but there was also um, some broader questions around whether it, um, which, which level of security um, it, it, that kind of information fell into. So there's different um, approaches, if you will, to data sharing, depending on uh, which category of national security data, data falls into. So that's data about ships. Um, data about where containers are is a different story altogether. Um, so our particular resolution was actually not necessarily tracking it whilst in shipment, though you can do that. What we were actually more interested in was to ensure that it arrived where it was meant to arrive. And so we could do that with RFID and um, local RFID scanning stations, which were identified as well. So that we we knew that the RFIDs were being scanned by by the right um, uh, scanners, um, and and that was the condition precedent on the data being sent. So um, so we we weren't affected by that issue, but that in a sense highlights emerging uncertainties around um, how data types will be treated in a cross jurisdictional context. Yay. Um, Jenny, just need a, 
Just very quick question for you about misinformation on Twitter and uh, Weibo. Um, we, we know there are different values, different views, uh, and a different framing on the two you know, platforms. Um, one, how do you identify the misinformation? Because it's not just about all the information posted on those platforms, but your job, your task was to identify misinformation. But how do you identify, you know, uh, uh, categorize which one is misinformation, which is not? And who's behind the misinformation, the sources? Thanks. All right, thank you. So I haven't mentioned that part of my work. <laughs> so we actually developed machine learning models to automatically uh, detect uh, misinformation. So on the social media platform, actually, there are rumors, lots of rumors. So in rumors, you know, to do uh, the automatic detection, actually, um, you know, um, we train a machine learning model based on some uh, data and um, with labels. And then we, um, you know, we, we can predict is this a sort of information that is likely to be um, false or true? So we can um, do that. And um, um, the input to make that, this, uh, for the machine to make that prediction would include um, analyzing the content as well as the uh, credibility of the information sources, as well as the other features like the broadcast, uh, you know, the, the pattern for propagation. So all sorts of information we use to make that prediction. And that, but that's separately, we haven't talked about misinformation detection in this work. And because Hai Ching said, oh, don't talk too much about your machine learning. <laughs> and um, your second question, who is behind uh, these misinformation? And um, uh, again, you know, like there are two types of misinformation. There is, you know, uh, people, um, you know, uh, just, accidentally broadcast false information that's not deliberate, but there are also um, disinformation, which are uh, purposely made misinformation to for political reasons, for any other reasons. So there are actually um, uh, another line of work we have been working on is to detect uh, these, what we call the trolling activities, actually. There are, you know, like um, there are, sp the, the sp they give that misinformation for specific purpose. And um, so there are two, you know, as what I mentioned just now, there are misinformation, just the information is false. Um, the, the information source may be just someone, uh, you know, who is unintentionally spread that as a rumor, but there are also people who made misinformation um, for some purpose, which are the trolling activities. Again, um, I think um, it's a, a collaboration between human and machines. So we develop machine, machines to help um, in collaboration with human to do the detection of the trolling activities. All right, and with that, I will formally close the panel and ask you all to thank our wonderful panelists uh, back at two o'clock for imaginary versus reality.